father had gotten into an altercation at work, and he was on the run. And you could have seen him look on his face when he said goodbye. He was running from the living home. I ran away from home before I turned nine. Second step, find a way to get to the water. While I was on the run, I met a group of gypsies. And I stayed with them for two years. And they treated me like, for all intents and purposes, like their family. I did a few chores and they helped me out. They fed me well. And when I was ready to leave, I rode trains to the docks and made my way onto a ship. Third step, get to France. I found my way into the very bottom of the biggest boat I saw. Unfortunately for me, it turned out to be a German freight boat headed to Aberdeen, Scotland. And minutes after I called on, I was caught by the crew. You can stay, make your bed and bail the bilge, and mop the deck, and maybe we'll all get along, said the German sailor. And to which I replied, yeah. <laughs> Danke, my head. I learned German during the trip. Aberdeen, I knew, was at least closer to France than Georgia. Mm -hmm. Step four, find a way to get from Aberdeen to London. I played lookout for gamblers in Glasgow, making a few dollars a week, and with that money, I moved on to Liverpool, where my young broke self accidentally stumbled into a boxing gym. With no more funds and no other place to turn to, I begged the owner to let me stay, to which he complied reluctantly. However, I saw it as an opportunity. I trained, I fought, I worked my way up, I made some money, I even fell in love. I even had a match in London. Step five, find a way to get from London to Paris. I had a match in Paris. A certain feeling you get when you win a fight. A certain feeling that because you were better than them, you're better than everyone else in the world, too. It's as if the sweat on your lips becomes wine. Your blood begins to vibrate inside you as if you're full of the sun. Well, I had finally made it to Paris, the land of my dreams. You know, sometimes you of a place for so long that when you finally get there, it doesn't quite live up to your expectations. And for me, well, this was not the case. Paris was perfect. I learned French within a month. Paris was victory. Paris was wine on my lips. Paris was the sun. But the year was 1914, and there was a cloud, big, dark, and ugly, sneaking across the sky. Bonjour, monsieur. Oui, je voudrais ménager. I would like to fight. <laughs> no, sir, but I am a boxer, a winning boxer, a fighter like you have never seen. Sorry, sir. No, I am not French, but I want to fight. No deal. The big war was here, and they weren't letting me fight for France because I was a étranger. Stranger. Luckily, it wasn't long before I found out about the Légion étrangère, the Legion of Strangers. Now, this was the place for me. In English, it is known as the French Foreign Legion. I was with Poles, Americans, Moroccans, and the color of my skin didn't matter because there were too many colors to count. About a month later, I was behind a machine gun. I remember exactly what it felt like. My knuckles were dried and cracking from the heat of the last volley. My load was slipping in bullets from the next belt. I slid my leg up in the mud to get closer to the gun. The hairs on my right cheek shriveled away from the heat. Breathe in, breathe out. Now. 
when you're boxing, winning means hitting another man above the belt with a padded glove and a referee. Here, winning means destroying as many bodies as you can before your gun overheats. This was not the fighting I was used to. I marched under multiple regiments in battles at the Artois Ridge and Moose River on the Somme and Champagne. In 1916, the Legion went from around 20,000 men to 10,000, and I was transferred to the 170th Regiment, and that number never left my column. We were known as Les Hirondelles de la Mort, the Swallows of Death. That's how I got my nickname. Then, I came to Lady Redon in 1916. This was nothing like what I was used to. This was horror. Countless bodies of my so-called comrades falling before me, but if it meant victory from a country that treated me like a human being, was necessary. Breathe in, breathe out. I saw German men and boys coming over the crest of what seemed like thousands. I held the trigger and sprayed. Breathe in, breathe out. Hold the trigger. Sweep left, sweep right. Breathe in, bang! It all went black. I woke up in a hospital in Lyon. I had German metal in my back and legs, and they thought I'd never walk again. Every day, I took another step. And every day, I received another medal from France, including the Medaille Militaire, the Medaille of Renaud, and the Quad I the most important honor of them all. Now, if you were injured like that, would you want to fight again? Of course not. But whether I wanted to fight or not, I wasn't about to go home. They put a hole in my leg, a hole in my back, and I fought on. A few months later, I found a new way to fight. This time, it was in the air. I had my hands on the stick.
Men like you can't fly. Men like me. Well, you know what? I think that's why I chose to wear this uniform for you all today. Well, how do I look? I bet I look good. But do I look American? I don't suppose so. It's a strange country, the one that bore me. Certainly no land of dreams. Well, soon enough, the war had ended. <coughs> and I stayed in France and started my own nightclub. Champagne, Josephine. I think I'll join you. I made friends with Josephine Baker, Louis Armstrong, Ernest Hemingway. I even played a little jazz. Married the daughter of a countess and had two wonderful daughters of my own. And all was well. All was well until I lost my wife. And every mouth in Europe started to whisper the word Hitler. The Great War was merely a warm up. I played spy for the French resistance. Out the Nazis leave in jazz music. Even Nazis love jazz. Remember the ship to Aberdeen? The German I learned there was coming in handy. France, like a bad boxer, didn't even eye or an ear to his enemy, and Europe darkened further. More. I didn't have much left to live for. I had to fight for my Even more than that, I had to feel victory again. I had to feel my blood vibrate inside me. I had to feel my heart go bright like the sun. So I marched south to find a fight, but this time there was no more 170th, no more proud Belgian, just some scraggly fighters operating out of a crumbling stone house. But I found a machine gun, and I got to work like that. And this time, my team must be safe. <coughs> Load faster! Load faster! Private, move the tribe out a little to the left. The, the left! Le gauche! A little more. There you go, set yourself down there. C closer. Closer! All right, good. Now you're like, <coughs> ready? Firing! Before we got through 20 rounds, German shells rained from the sky in silence. I woke up in every hospital. <laughs> I wanted to fight again, but this time there was no chance. I limped to the sea, following refugees down the beaten and burning roads until I found a port. I asked to leave. They told me I couldn't, but I did. I moved to Harlem all by myself, taking odd jobs when they came. Every night, I dreamed of friends. Was I really there? Did I see the things I saw? Maybe the land of my dreams was just a dream. Back home, an old war was burning like it always had. My father, versus the world, clones. But I realized that this war, it wasn't just against my father. It was against everyone who looked like him. A few years later, 1949 to be exact, I decided to go see a Paul Robeson concert in Peekskill, New York. Now, so as I was staring in the crowd, looking through the heads in the crowd, Black, brown, and white, all smiling and squinting in the afternoon sun as I tried to get a glimpse of the stage a half a mile ahead. All of a sudden, I heard a strange sound and looked down to see a glove of spit on my shoe. I looked to my right to see a man staring me dead in the eyes, the man who had just spit on me. He was wearing a World War II vest. Excuse me, sir, but did you just spit on me? 
My name is Eugene Jacques Bullard, a veteran of both when he had punched me in the face. There's no misunderstanding here in there. Before he could say anything more, I gave him a quick jab, nothing too hard. I tried to walk away, but more men appeared behind him, and on the other side of me, a state trooper and a police officer were swinging the way. Within seconds, I was on the ground being kicked and spat upon by three men. I'd like to tell you that, as a veteran, as a boxer, I held my own. Yes, I'm my own truth. I was beaten. A soldier is always a soldier, and a boxer is always a boxer. But an old man with metal in him can only be so much. I limped back to my car, and the mob beat the cops and goats, cracking skulls, cutting faces. Black women and children were treated no differently. and I healed up most of the way. Before I found myself a nice uniform position as an elevator operator at Rockefeller Center. Hi, man. Four. You got it. I suppose this is how I'll write it out. But I wasn't bitter. Not about anything. They say life is full of ups and downs. Up and down, up and down. Well, there is one more up that I'll tell you folks about. Reminds me where you are. I get a very official looking letter in the mail from France. It says that I am to read like the eternal tomb, read like the eternal My heart flutters, and suddenly I'm on the western end of the Champs Elysees. And as I kneel by the fire and those flowers, and I lit that flame and felt the heat on the back of my old weathered hand, and I see the sun through the Arc de Triomphe hit my face, I can't help but smile because I realized then that France wasn't a dream, not one bit of it. I died in 61, buried in Queens. Buried in Queens with full French military honors. I was born here, and I died here, but I was buried with the French flag. In 1994, the US Air Force commissioned me as a second lieutenant, almost 80 years after they had denied me. And I wonder if my daughter saw that. I hope so. Well, thank you very much, and I hope that you enjoyed this. And if you have any more questions, like to know anything else, feel free to find me.